Moving on to the next topic within geoprotective drugs, metformin. Where would you place that? Well, I'll say today I would place it in the fuzzy category. I, I actually would have put this in the promising category 100 episodes ago. Um, and uh, again, you know, I think we're going to point people back to a podcast that I did with Andrew Huberman um, last year. It was a journal club that we did where I talked about what I believe are the two most important uh, large epidemiologic papers that are trying to address this question indirectly. Um, and um, so, so I, I obviously won't rehash that in all the great detail, but these two studies, which um, the first one was done in 2014, the second one in 2022, I think represent the bookends of an observation that creates a lot of interest. And I think this is a great example of where ed epidemiology is very helpful. So in, in 2014, uh, Bannister et al. published something that at the time was almost impossible to believe. Uh, and I, I certainly remember reading it in real time. I, I remember getting an embargoed copy before it came out um, and, and, and just really being shocked. So the, the study at the surface looked at people who had type 2 diabetes who were taking metformin and people who did not have type 2 diabetes and who were obviously not taking metformin. And it asked the question, who had a lower all-cause mortality rate? Now, of course, we know that people with type 2 diabetes are going to have their lives truncated by an average of six to seven years relative to someone without type 2 diabetes. So you wouldn't think that the addition of metformin to somebody with type 2 diabetes would materially affect that. Maybe it would close that gap from six and a half years to four years or something like that. But in fact, what the study found was, no, the, the, the people taking metformin with type 2 diabetes actually lived slightly longer than the people who did not. In fact, there was about a 15% reduction in all-cause mortality over a three-year follow-up period. Obviously, it's done in an enormous population um, using a UK um, biobank uh, data set. So, you know, that paper, I believe more than any other paper, set the stage for the excitement around metformin as a geroprotective compound. Because what's clear is that the diabetics taking metformin still had inferior glycemic control to the non-diabetics. So in other words, it's not that they are, if they're living longer, it's not because they have better glycemic control. It, it would seem to be that it's, they're better because of something else that metformin is doing outside of managing presumably hepatic glucose output. Now, I've had Nir Barzilai on the podcast twice and will again encourage people who are interested in this to go back and listen to those podcasts as well. Uh, because Nir has argued that indeed metformin is geroprotective and that there are many benefits to metformin that completely transcend its uh, properties within the liver for glycemic control. Um, but I have become less convinced of that. Um, and so I think, as I talk about in the podcast with Andrew, um, I think there were a lot of holes in the Bannister study. Um, and I think they center around methodology, something called informative censoring, where the patients who were in the metformin diabetes arm um, were censored out of the analysis that demonstrated a reduced mortality if they were lost to follow up, um, if they died, or, uh, pardon me, um, if they, um, if, or if they had a medication change. So, um, and usually a medication change on someone who's only taking metformin is meaning that the disease is progressing, so you're adding another medication. So the problem with that is, uh, I think, obvious when you realize that you were censoring out people 
who were sicker and you were so actually selecting for the healthiest possible people, not to mention the fact that um, you're also, you know, not doing this in a randomized fashion. And I cover all of that detail elsewhere. So the follow up study was which was done by Keys et al in 2022, uh, basically sought to improve on the methodology of the Bannister paper. And it did something quite clever, which is it repeated the analysis um, using a different uh, patient cohort. So it's a Danish um, uh, patient population cohort. Um, but it set up two studies within the study, one very similar to what the Bannister uh, experiment was, and then one using a set of twins who differed only in that, uh, you know, one had diabetes and one didn't. So um, what was interesting here, so again, that's a, that's a clever design, right? It's, and it's hard to do. And um, they actually found the opposite. They found exactly what you would expect to find, which is whether you were talking about identical twins, fraternal twins, unrelated people, if you had type 2 diabetes, even if you were on metformin, your risk of mortality was significantly higher. And it varied anywhere from 33% higher uh, to 80% higher, again, depending on the covariate analysis and the cohort, the cohort that was being looked at. Again, this was much more consistent with, with what one would expect. And, 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 you know, this is kind of, um, I, I think, a better analysis for several reasons. Here's what's most interesting, though, Nick. They actually went and then did an informative censoring analysis to see if, indeed, informative censoring was exclusively responsible for the results in the Bannister paper. And it turned out it wasn't. In other words, even when they repeated that methodology, they still produced the finding you would expect. So in addition to this, I think the other reason I would continue to keep metformin in a fuzzy category as opposed to a promising category at this point. And remember, fuzzy doesn't mean it doesn't work. Fuzzy means we need more data to upgrade. Um, is that metformin has failed in the ITP. And again, we'll link to both of the podcasts with Rich Miller, where we talk about the ITP in detail and why the ITPs are such impressive studies and why so few molecules have succeeded in the ITP. But metformin is not one of them. In fact, the only time metformin, to my recollection, has ever been positive in an ITP was when it was combined with rapamycin. But metformin alone did not succeed, whereas other drugs, such as canagliflozin, acarbose, rapamycin, have succeeded. So I don't want to go on too much further because, again, this, this content exists elsewhere, and I just want to really focus people on the high level. My view today is that metformin is in the fuzzy category. One other thing I should say is that there is a study that is eventually getting funded. In fact, it might, I mean, technically, I guess it, it is funded. I don't know if it's began enrollment yet called the TAME study. And the TAME study is going to attempt to answer this question in humans by studying disease onset in susceptible but otherwise helpful, healthy individuals. And that's why I think it's safe to say that, look, whether it's episode 400 or episode 500, we are definitely going to be talking about metformin again. Uh -huh.